Praise the Lord, church, and good morning. It's Good Friday. We praise the name of the Lord for a good Friday. It is the best of all the days, the best of all the Fridays. It's the most important day in the Christian calendar. It is when the most significant thing happened uh, in the history of the world since when men sinned against God. Um, I want us to pray, then I will bring us an Easter message as uh, put in my heart by the Lord to share with us today. So let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to indeed uh, cause us to experience the spirit of Easter. Holy Spirit of God, we thank you and pray that um, you will reveal Jesus as we read through the text and reflect about the events of Easter, reflect about your death, the pain, the shame, the things that happened that bought our salvation, your shed blood, your shredded body. Lord, as we reflect about those things, I pray that indeed our hearts will be, ca will be captured by your love. Our hearts will be drawn to you. Holy Spirit of God, lead us to where it matters. Lift our hearts and our eyes to Jesus as we look into the word of God together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to uh, share with us a, an Easter message, something to help us reflect about what really matters uh, as we go about the season. Of course, it's a holiday for the world, and it can easily feel like it is just time to travel Ushago. It is time to travel all over the place. And while we travel, while we do uh, what we, the break allows us to do, it is good for us to have perspective and never lose um, our sight on what really happened in this Easter holiday or in this Easter season. Uh, I will begin our reading, uh, our conversation uh, from the book of Matthew. Book of Matthew chapter, chapter 26. And the Bible says, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to the disciples, as you know, Passover begins in two days and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. At that same time, the leading priest and elders were meeting at the residence of Caiaphas, the high priest, plotting how to capture Jesus secretly and kill him, but not during the Passover celebration. They agreed, but, but not during the Passover celebration, they agreed. All the people may riot. Oh, Jesus knew the time had come for the reason he had come. He knew that uh, he had come for this very moment. He had come so that he can die, and through his death, the wrath of God be satisfied, and the blood that he would shed would buy us from the world, would buy for himself the church. Uh, there are many things he did, you know, from the birth to all his life, uh, especially the three years of ministry. He did miracles, he cast out demons, he healed the sick, he did a lot of things, but he knew that was not only the reason he came. There was a, a higher reason for his coming, and that moment was coming, and it's not, it was not going to be an easy moment. So he tells the disciples that hour is actually near. And, well, they didn't understand these things until when he was actually crucified. Um, he happened to visit Simon um, around this uh, season, and... Uh, from verse 6, we are told while he was in Bethany in the house of Simon, uh, a man who had previously been healed from leprosy, uh, while they were eating and drinking there, a woman uh, came with an alabaster jar, and she burst the jar and poured out very expensive perfume on Jesus, and she washed his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. And... The people felt, what, what is this woman doing here? In fact, uh, Judas seemed to have suggested this, this, this perfume. We could have sold it and, uh, and, and found some money and perhaps helped the poor with the money. And Jesus said, what this woman has done, because of course some Pharisees there were saying, oh, if he is the, if he's a prophet, 
he should be able to know what manner of, of woman is this. He should be able to determine that this is a, pro, uh, is a prostitute. And as people, you know, are saying all those things, Jesus knew in what was in their heart. And he said, this woman, he's doing this because he, she has been forgiven so much. And he said, by using a parable, if one is forgiven little debt, he will love little. But if you are forgiven much debt, you will love so much. And so this woman was loving Jesus with all herself because she had been forgiven so much. She had been forgiven that life of a prostitute. Jesus had given her a second chance. And so she loved him. But Jesus said, wherever the gospel will be preached, the story of this woman will be shared. And again, it's because she did something so significant. Well, she thought she was just loving on Jesus. She was actually preparing his body for his death. She didn't have that revelation, but she was just doing what she was feeling pushed in her spirit to do. She was loving Jesus the way she knew how to. It just turned out to be that this would be the oil that, pre, you know, that prepares his body for that moment. It was all prophetic. The people thought, oh, what, what, what is a prostitute doing here? But it was all scripted in the mind of God. It was all prophetic. It all made sense to Jesus. And, and of course, he sobbed them and accepted the worship of this woman. And just at that point, when this is happening, uh, Jesus is talking about his, his death. And the, we have read that the, the, the high priest and the leaders of the religious law, the religious people, are looking for an opportunity to crucify Jesus, but they are telling themselves, we need to catch him and kill him. But not on the Sabbath day, because people will riot. While they are having that discussion, Judas, uh, verse 14, then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples, went to the leading priest and asked, how much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? You know that this feel, felt like a divine moment for them. I mean, what a coincidence. We are looking for how to kill Jesus, how to arrest him. And then one of his disciples just shows up and is willing to give us this support. Is willing, it, it felt like a God moment <laughs> for them. Jesus, Judas showed up just at the right time, you know. And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. And from that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to, be, to betray Jesus. And not, not long after that, um, they, they had, they, they, they had, the, the celebration of the, of the unlivered bread was near. All these things are happening very fast. So it was that week towards the, the celebration of the unlivered bread or what they call the Passover, the Passover celebration. And Jesus, and the disciples, of course, were to celebrate the Passover. And the disciples asked him, where are we going to celebrate the Passover? And Jesus told them, as you go into the city, he told them, you will see a certain man. Tell, tell him, the teacher says, my time has come and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. What they did not understand is what Jesus is saying, my time has come. They didn't know what time he is talking about. And... But they knew about the Passover. It was uh, an Old Testament celebration connoting the day when, uh, when Jesus, when, when God rescued his children, the Israelites from Egypt that night when he delivered them with a mighty hand and he killed the firstborns of the Egyptians and by the blood of the lamb that, that Moses told them through the instructions of God, that they would kill a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost of their doors. And so when the angel of death would, uh, came at night, he, he looked at the doors. And the door that had blood, he skipped, he passed over. He did not enter, he did not ask who is inside. I guess that if there was an Egyptian inside the house, he still uh, escaped the death. Because the, the angel just looked at the sign that was on the blood. Uh, that was on the door. That was the blood of the lamb. And uh, 
And so the disciples were looking forward to this uh, celebration. Not the disciples, only every Jew was looking forward to this celebration. It was a big celebration. Um, and so the, the Jesus says, let's, let's uh, prepare this meal in this person's house. It was an upper room. They prepare the meal there. And while they are having that meal, Jesus just redefines it. Jesus gives it a whole new meaning. To everybody, it was unlivered bread. It was the Passover, an Old Testament ritual that God uh, had instituted in the time of Moses. It was to be done every year. They were just doing a normal anniversary celebration that had nothing on top of it. But Jesus gave it a new meaning because he declared while they were having that meal, Jesus said these very important words. He said, this, he took the bread that they were using for the meal. He said, this is my body. In fact, I will read from verse 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from this. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. They had never heard that before. Bread was bread, wine was wine until that moment. Jesus had given the Passover a new meaning. Because everything in the Old Testament tells us about Jesus. It points to Jesus. He is the reason and the center of the Old Testament law and prophecy. No wonder he would tell us at the very beginning of the book of Matthew that he has not come to, to abolish the law, but he has come to fulfill it. Because he is the fulfillment of everything that we see. Uh, everything in the Old Testament is a shadow. When he comes, he gives us the reality. So he's telling them that Passover lamp in the Old Testament was just but a shadow. That blood that was, uh, that was put on the doorpost was just but a shadow. The truth and the reality, the real thing, is Jesus himself being the lamp and his own blood being the redemption of many. So after he had redefined that and given them a new understanding. Of course, they would understand it the following day because that is when the blood would be shed, the body would be shredded. They would understand just in a few hours' time uh, after, wet, uh, after that moment. He began to tell them that one of you is going to betray me. He's talking to them uh, and, you know, and they are eating together and then he tells them, you know, one of you is going to betray me. And one by one they said, uh, that is verse 20, when it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve, where they were eating, and, and he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly dis distressed, each one asked in turn, am I the one, Lord? He replied, one of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me, for the Son of Man must die as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible is it for the one who betrays him? It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Verse 25, Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you have said it. How sad, how sad that was. Even Judas wondered, whether he would be the one who is going to betray the Savior. Yet he has already gone to the high priest, he's been paid the money, he's looking for the opportunity, but he's still asking him, am I going to be the one who betrays you? Um, I don't have the words to expound that. I just pray that um, the Lord will deliver me and deliver you from sitting with the Savior, eating with the Savior, but... Your heart is not with the Savior. And you're still wondering, as the others are wondering, whether you're going to betray him. And you've already 
betrayed him. But again, I also recognize that Judas would not be able to escape this thing by his own strength. Judas left to himself without the help of the Lord himself, without the help of the Holy Spirit. No one Christian can stand and say, I cannot betray the Lord. And uh, we, will sh we will see that just in a short while. So after this incident, of course, Jesus did not uh, really dwell on Judas. He did not rebuke him. He did not even expound on what Judas would do. Really, his, his, his center was not Judas. He didn't, you know, keep his mind fixated on Judas. He kept his mind fixated on the job that he needed to do. Jesus knew that Judas needed to fulfill the scriptures. So he quickly moved on to something else. They sang a hymn and then off they went to the garden of Gethsemane or the Mount of Olives. And while on their way to the Mount of Olives, Jesus tells them, wow, he tells them that Peter, he tells Peter, today you're going to deny me. Um, that is verse 31. On the way Jesus told them, tonight all of you will desert me. He had just told them very heavy things at the table that one of them will betray. And then on the way to the prayer mountain, he tells them, Atta, by the way, we on Imoja too, that is just one that I have just described that would betray. Even tonight, all of you, all of you will desert me. For the scripture says, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Then Peter says, Hey, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night, before the cock crows, you will deny three times that you even ever knew me, ever know me. That if I've no, Peter insisted. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all other disciples vowed the same. Peter is self-confident, and of course all other disciples are self-confident. They cannot deny the Savior. But they didn't know how intense the moment will be. Peter says, even if everybody else does it, not me, Lord. I will not deny you. And I, I can hear my voice in the voice of Peter. Of course, in the songs that I sing, in the proclamations that I make when I'm happy, when life is good, when everything is going right, when I am experiencing miracles, I'm experiencing revelation, I've just eaten bread and had wine, I've been, I am in the same. It's so easy to say, Lord, I cannot deny you. I cannot deny that at least I know you. Jesus is saying, you're going to deny even the very basics that you know me, you will deny it three times this very night. That is how the arm of the flesh is. Brothers and sisters, unless the Holy Spirit helps you, don't beat your chest and say, you know, I cannot backslide. I can't do that. I can't do that. Or I will do this for God. Everything that we do in the Lord and for God, we are enabled. It is the Spirit of God that gives us to will and to do. Everything that we don't do because of the cross of Jesus, because we are born again, the things that we don't do, it is not that we can't, we can beat our chest and say, oh me, I'm born again, I can't do that thing. The moment that begins is the moment we begin to backslide. Paul tells the church, beware, because when you think you're standing, then you fall. It is only by the help of the Holy Spirit that we can be able to, with a lot of humility, walk with Jesus. It is with a lot of humility and understanding of how weak the flesh is. The, weak, the flesh is so weak and unable. Unless the Spirit of God helps you, unless you realize your own poverty of heart and how much you need Him, you will be so self-confident. And that self-confident will be tested. <coughs> By the way, your self-confident will be tested. And I pray that I will rely on Jesus. I will know that well, the things that I do or the things that I don't do because of working with Jesus are all a result of grace. It is all the Lord helping me. 
But, but while everyone was self-confident of what they would do and what they would not do, Jesus approached that moment with intensity of prayer. And that is how we are to approach life. Jesus knew how intense the moment was. And that moment could only be approached by an equivalent intensity of prayer. There are some situations of life that uh, will require different measures. They say desperate moment call for desperate measures. There are situations that cannot be dealt with by two minutes of prayer, by five minutes of prayer. Jesus had many types of prayer. There are times when he actually cast out demons with a simple word. The Bible says that he cast out the demon with a simple word. He was not praying intensely all the time for all things, but for this specific area of his life, the intensity of the moment at this point would not require a simple word. He required a whole night of prayer. And he actually shared with his disciples, with his trusted friends, Peter uh, uh, and John and James, the sons of Thebedee. He, he shared with them the intensity of the moment and he told them how, in fact, he said, verse 36 and to, from 36, he says, then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. That is how intense the moment was. My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Look at how Jesus is asking for prayer. He is even asking for prayer from people, from his friends. He's telling them, my spirit is so, my soul is so crushed. The grief is so intense. He said, please pray for me. Please stay here and pray. And he is not asking them to pray while he keeps quiet or while he sleeps. He went a little further, bowed down to the ground and prayed. This is the prayer where he prayed until his sweat became blood. And he was praying so that um, he is saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. I like the motivation. Sometimes not every cup will be removed. Even with the intensity of prayer, the goal is not for the cup to be removed, but for the Lord to give capacity to endure the cup and to overcome to the other side. If the cup is removed, the church will not be born. If the cup is removed, the assignment will not be done. If the cup is removed, the scripture will not be fulfilled. So Jesus knew that it is not the will of God to remove the cup. Ha! It is a hard cup. It is a difficult. He wishes that it could be removed, but then he knew that is not how he should pray. He is praying that the will of God is done nonetheless. While his prayer partner slept, uh, do not be very disappointed if you have really shared your prayer request with your trusted friends and they don't get it. They don't get the intensity of the moment. They don't get the weight of the grief. They don't get, you tell them, Aki, can you fast for me? And then you find them eating. Can you pray? And then, I think this is a good example. Jesus found his prayer partner sleeping. Three times, not one time. He woke them two times. I mean, he was so gracious and, 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 and kind. If I found, if I had, if I was going through such an intense moment and I have these trusted friends that we are praying together and then all they are doing is sleeping and all the time I'm the one going to wake them up, I will just give up on them. I will say, your church is end tena. How watu hata watakuwa marafiki zangu tena? How watu wanakuanga fake? How watu wanakuanga tu ni chocha? Hakuna kitu. I think I would throw a lot of tantrums. They did not support me in my hour of need. Uh, they, they did not show me support. I think that is uh, how we, we take it. But Jesus woke them up to pray three times. The final time, he actually told them, so guys, uh, so he went to pray at that time saying, the same things. 
Jesus was praying the same prayer item. Then he came to the disciples and said, go ahead and sleep. Have you, have your rest. I think he was already worked up by this moment also. But look, the time has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. He had already told them, we are praying so that he is saying, you guys pray so that you don't even fall into temptation. But anyway, time was up. The betrayer had already arrived. And yes, so Judas had a pre-agreed signal with the enemy. <laughs> he was to kiss Jesus and to call him rabbi. And he did that. Jesus said, don't waste your time. Just, he said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come to do. Jesus knew what was going on. The hour had already started to unfold. He had already been given over to the hands of the, he was going to be given over in that moment to the hands of the evildoers. Then they grabbed him, arrested him, uh, and then the disciples are wondering, Peter was there. Uh, I think he's the one who took the sword and struck the ear of the high priest live slashing off his ear, but Jesus said, put away your sword. And he, he, he replaced, he healed the person um, right in that moment. They couldn't even see that miracle. They were so preoccupied with arresting him and killing him. Jesus said if he wanted, he would have asked for angels. This is what he says. Don't you realize that if don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and you send them instantly? If Jesus wanted to be protected from this hour of the cross, in fact, nobody took away his life. Jesus willingly gave himself. It is not every time that we should ask for angels, for protection, for... Um, it's not every time that the Lord does things that preserve us um, the way we want it or the way we think about preservation. Because if, had he been protected, if the angels came and protected Jesus from this moment, what would happen to the mission? What would happen to what he had come to do? He had not come to be protected by angels in this hour. He had come to die. And he knew that it was written of him in the scriptures that in this moment, he would die so that the mission can be accomplished, so that salvation can be bought. Uh, and so Jesus would not um, sell or trade off that mission for his own self-preservation. And so he accepted the moment. It's not that the heavens abandoned him or that he could not have called fire upon them, but this was not the moment to call down fire. This was the moment to submit and carry the cross and endure for what it would take to birth that magnitude of impact, that magnitude of vision. It amazes me that when they arrested him, the first place they took him was before the high council. It was not before the governors. It was not before the government. They took him before the priests at the first place. The people who had arrested Jesus led him to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, as the first place. That is uh, 20, chapter 26, verse 57. And uh, meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and came, sat with the guards and waited to see how it would all end. Inside the leading priest uh, and the entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death? Can you imagine what kind of church that was? Of course, they didn't call it church that time. What kind of religious, uh, what kind of faith was that? Let me just put it that way. People of faith, the leading high priest and the leading council that time, they were trying to find witnesses that would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. They were so obsessed with putting him to death that they didn't care whether it would take false witnesses or what it would take for them to do that. Have you realized how law and religion can become an idol and a barrier for seeing the Messiah? 
They were so blinded. They couldn't see the Messiah. They couldn't see Jesus. They couldn't even see the law that they purported to obey. They were trying to find false witnesses. And they could not find anyone. The Bible says that even though they found many who agreed to give false witnesses, they could not use anybody's testimony. As in every testimony that they found was fake, was, was, could not stand. It was, it was not holding water. <laughs> or in Kenyan times, I don't know whether we will say it was hot air. But they, they, they were aggressively looking for someone that could, that could be, uh, that could give them a reason to kill Jesus. They were, let me say, aggressively fault finding. Finally, two men came forward who declared, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Of course, he was talking about his own body. But they said, this, that is what he said, that he was, is, is going to destroy the temple and raise it in three days. And then they say, what do you have to say for yourself? They are asking Jesus. But Jesus remained silent. Then the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Somehow in their hearts they felt, maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe he's the Messiah. But they needed him to tell him, I don't know in how many words. Jesus replied, you have said it. And in the future, you will see the Son of God seated, you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Where? Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, Blasphemy! Why do we need other witness? You have heard he is blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they shouted. He deserves to die. Then they began to spit on Jesus' face and beat him with their fists. And some slapped him, saying and jeering, Prophesy to us, you Messiah, who hit you that time? Who hit you that time? They, they were so obsessed by the moment. Of course, it was God's divine moment for that to happen that they, they missed out on what they were looking for. They were looking for the Messiah in the law. They were waiting for the fulfillment of time. They were waiting for the prophesied Messiah in the, uh, you know, through the prophets. But they missed it altogether. They missed him. They thought this is another person. And so they treated him just as we have read. Peter is still following from a distance. And at this point, two slave girls and a bystander. It is very interesting that the Bible would clearly say who they were. Slave girls and a bystander. They challenge Peter. They say to him, Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came and said to him, you are one of those with Jesus the Galilean. But Peter denied in front of everyone, I don't know what you are talking about, he said. Later, out by the gate, another servant girl, the Bible not, uh, records, noticed him and said uh, to those standing around, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter de denied it, this time even with an oath. I don't even know the man, he said. Then a little later, one of another bystander <laughs> came over to Peter and said, you must be the one, you must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter saw a curse on me if I am lying. I don't know the man. <laughs> And immediately the cock crowed and suddenly Jesus' words flashed through the mind of Peter. Before the cock crows, you will have denied three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. So Peter, I, I had said before that he was so sure, he, had so, he was so self-confident that he's not going to betray the Savior. But when the moment came. It was heated, it was intense. He knew that he needed more than self-confidence. He needed more than the flesh to stand by his testimony. I pray for you if you're tested 
And if you are almost denying the Lord, that the Holy Spirit will help you in that intense, it, you cannot survive it by the flesh. And then Judas, one of the disciples, now seeing how the things are unfolding, he realized that, wow, now they are going to kill him. They have sentenced him to death. And he was remorseful. And he tried to deal with his remorse by himself. He did not know how bad things would turn out, I guess. He, he only opened a small door that he thought was a small door. It, it, it happened to be a whole floodgate. You know, the devil only asked you for a foothold. He did not know it was a door leading to much more depth of sin and wickedness. The devil did not tell him that he would not stop at the foothold. He will go all the way. When Judas realized that he cannot reverse what he had started, he cannot save the situation, he can't salvage the situation by his strength, by his, his wisdom, or even by his collaboration. Remember, he had used his wisdom and his strength and his collaborations to betray Jesus. Now he could not reverse that situation using the same process. He decided to hang himself. Even by hanging himself, he could not save himself because you cannot undo the sin in your life. You cannot undo the sin of the world by dealing it yourself. Even your own sacrifice cannot save you. Judas could not be saved even by the sacrifice of his own blood. I wish he turned to Jesus because Jesus knew that he would betray him. I wish he turned to him for repentance. So when he took the money back, they actually were rude. They retorted. They said, that's your problem. And the silver money, the, the 30 pieces of silver that they had paid him, Judas returned it to the temple. But then they said, ah, we can't put it to the offering because this is, this is what they said. We, it is not right to put this money in the temple treasury, they said, since it was payment for murder. Can you imagine? Then after discussions, they bought a plot of, of land, which they turned into a cemetery for foreigners. And, 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 uh, and they, they, they buried Judas there. Then they took Jesus to Pilate. Uh, I should be about to finish now. They, they put, they, they took Jesus to Pilate and, um, Pilate listened to them. Of course, Jesus was innocent. There was nothing he could find to crucify Jesus. He knew that he was innocent. Even his own wife had a dream, uh, God showing him that the man was innocent. But for political reasons, he refused to stand his ground. Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent and that he had not done anything deserving to be hanged on the cross. But because of political reasons, he refused to stand on his ground. He refused to pay the cost for the truth. Because the truth will always cost. To stand by your truth, you have to pay some cost. And Pilate was not willing to pay that cost. He played his cards well. He released the man. He released the, the criminal, Barabbas. Barabbas, it was custom that during Passover, the governor would release one criminal who set him free. And he asked them, which one do you want, Jesus or Barabbas? People said Barabbas. And he released him. He knew that Barabbas was guilty, but he released him to the people. He could say, but what else could I have done? The people wanted him. My hands were tied. That is what I keep hearing. And so many Christians, when they don't want to pay the cost of the truth, when they don't want to do what is right because it's going to cost them their job, it's going to cost them whatever, it's going to cost them, when they don't want to stand by the truth, they say, my hands were tied. Yes, your hands are tied by your own greed and by your own desire for self-preservation. That is what was tying the, the hands of Pilate. Self-preservation. It's not that he didn't know the truth. It's that he didn't know what is right to do. But he had to be politically correct. He needed to preserve his job. He needed to preserve favor with the Jews. And so, yes, his hands were tied. I want to stop here and ask yourself, 
Are your hands tied to do what is right? Do you have that excuse? That you, you know, there's nothing I can do. The people want it. I don't know what else I can do. That is what the, but what is the truth? Are you going to stand by your truth? And after that, of course he washed his hands to show that he has nothing to do. That he washed his hands doesn't make him right. Because he was a king and he could do something about, at least he could stand by some truth. But he chose to play the cards well. So he washed his hands and handed Jesus over to the Roman soldiers. They took him, mocked him, they, 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 they removed his clothes, and then they put him a mockery gown of priest, uh, of, of a king. They put a crown of thorns on his, uh, on his head. They, they jeered him. They didn't know that they were actually mocking their own savior. But at this point, of course, their job mattered, who they were mattered. And so, well, they did what they did. They mocked him. And you know, at some point, um, when something doesn't make sense to your academic sense or to your profession, you may think that it doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to them as professionals. And so they carried out their mandates. A lot of things happened here. The details are given. How they, they ashamed him, they inflicted pain on him. They, I have said about the thorn of, of, um, the crown of thorns that they made for him as mockery. How they put on him, uh, you know, uh, it is Herod actually who gave him the garment of a, a, a king. If then he is king, they, they, then, then they gave him a pretense, uh, a pretense, a uh, scepter. Then they used it again to, to hit him on the head. After all that, Jesus was quiet. All this process. In fact, the Bible records how it amused even Pilate that Jesus was quiet. All this time, he didn't say anything. Then they, the verdict was, was done. They put him, they caused him to carry the cross. But at this point, he was so weak from the beating, from the blood he was already shedding from the thorns. The body was weak. And so they grabbed someone, they met someone called Simon of Cyrene on the road. They grabbed him by force and made him to carry the cross for Jesus. Now something interesting happened. Simon didn't know Jesus. Simon didn't know what was happening. He was from Africa. He had no idea what is going on. He was probably here because of the Passover. Maybe he was a Jew, a black Jew that was there to celebrate the, the Passover. They seized him, caused him to carry the cross. And he accepted to carry it. Anyway, he didn't have options. He carried it. But later in the book of Mark chapter 15 verse 21 and even in the book of Romans 16, the sons of this Simon of Cyrene are mentioned. His sons Alexander and Rufus, they are mentioned as followers of Jesus. That moment that he carried the cross changed his life completely. It is possible that he became a Christian and wherever he went, he preached about Jesus. He witnessed the suffering firsthand. He helped carry the cross firsthand and his sons became uh, followers of Jesus and maybe more others. They hung him on the cross. Soldiers, passers-by, the, the, the priest, the people of religion all mocked Jesus when he hung there on the cross. It felt that it was over. In fact, they told him, if you are the Messiah, the king of the Jews, they even hung um, a label there that says king of the Jew. Not because they meant it, but because it was mockery. But it was true. He was the king of the Jew. And not only the Jews, he was the king of all the world. They put him there. And they felt, it done. What can he do? Let him remove himself from the cross if he is the savior indeed. He saved others. Let him save himself. He was obviously weak. And it was done according to them. But then, at around noon, while he hung there on the cross, the earth was engulfed for a three-hour darkness. It was darkness that someone can touch. It became dark for three hours. There was earthquake. 
And at 3 p.m., when he finally lifted his voice and called, and, and called out, um, the words that he called out, Eli, Eli, lama sama kithan, and gave up his spirit. People thought he is calling Elijah. But at that moment, the, there was such a great earthquake. The curtain in the temple tore from, from top to bottom. The cemeteries went open. They burst open. And people realized, by the way, it's not business as usual. We thought we are done. We thought we are finished that business. They witnessed the creation, witnessing that Jesus is actually God. He is the Lord. But what could they do? They had just, they had already crucified him. They had mocked him. What could he, what could they have done? Now their only hope for salvation is to put their faith on that Jesus they have, they have just hanged on the cross. The creation was witnessing to them. There is, there is nothing they could do about their deeds. They could reverse their deeds. And then Jesus died. On the cross. When he died, of course in those days, people who would, uh, the, the soldiers would break people, the people that they, are, that are hanging on the cross because it was known to hang criminals on the cross. They would break your legs uh, so that you die quickly. And they, need, they needed to die quickly before the Passover. <laughs> so they, they came and broke the legs of the thieves and but when they came to Jesus, they said he is already dead. And so they, they pierced him on the side and water and blood gushed out of his side. Because the Bible had said the bones of Jesus could not be bro would not be broken. Then they thought hmm, they, they are not going to break his bones. They didn't know it is fulfillment of scripture. And later, Joseph and Nicodemus went to the governors and asked for the body of Jesus, and they went, buried it in the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had prepared for his own burial. They pulled a stone, put it there. And the next day after they had buried Jesus, the leaders uh, of the priest and the Pharisees went to Pilate and they told him, we remember that that deceiver once said he, while he was alive, after three days he will rise from the dead. So they requested that you seal that, so we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everybody that he was raised from the dead. So they did that. They sealed the tomb and they even put guards on that tomb so that uh, they will keep Jesus dead and keep it on the tomb. I will pick this up here later, maybe on Sunday or on Monday, and talk about what happened after they put Jesus on the tomb. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. Have yourself a great Easter. Take the message of salvation out there. Take the message of the cross out there. Let people know the reason of for the season. Let the people be united with Jesus. At whatever point, whether it is as short as Simon of Cyrene, uh, let them hear the message of Jesus and the significance of the season. The Lord bless you. Bless your travels. Bless your rest. Whatever it is and whatever it is that you're doing this season, may the Lord bless you. Bless you. Amen.